with the first property now, we were it was going to complete on Friday, and I'm I'm in the gym car park on a Tuesday, mm. right? And my clients are in the gym, so I get an email from the MD of this company saying, "Hi guys, um, I've just been reviewing your overall case, and we need to have a chat because you're so adamant on pushing through property two with the charging orders. We now think you're a risk in terms of lending." We'll still lend you this money, but what we want is to take another charge on this other property that you own in the background. You are joking. Now, this wasn't my best moment, mate. So I, I called I called the lender. I called the managing director of this company. And we were on the phone at like 15, 20 minutes. I said, look, this is, this is ridiculous. Like, what do you expect me to tell my clients? How are you justifying this? What has one got to do with the other? They're not going ahead with this anyway. Mm. He's like, yeah, no, we've just, we've just reviewed it. And we think because of the risk, we want to take another charge. Um... And I, I just couldn't believe it. And I think this is like the worst. This is old school bridging where they just want to take a charge and then take your assets off you. Yeah. That's what people hear the horror stories about. Yeah. I've never come across it before. They did it. In the end, they had to because they paid all the legal fees. They paid all the fees. It was so it, it was complete in three days, you know, afterwards. Um, and I mean, yeah, I'm not in the lender's good books anymore, but, you know, it is what it is. Hey, thank you guys for tuning in. My name's Gov and welcome to another episode of the Property Newbie Podcast. On this week's show, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Shazad Ahmed, a mortgage and bridging finance expert. In this podcast, we discussed everything from the basics of bridging, how to get started right through to the complex nature of it and the risks associated with it, along with your mortgage queries as well. And we had time to answer every single question that got sent in along with your individual case studies as well. So this podcast was full of absolute gold. As always, if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to like, please be sure to subscribe and turn on those bell notifications for more videos like this. And if you want to listen to the podcast on the go, we're available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts and Spotify, the links for which are all in the description below. But enough about that. Sit back, relax and enjoy the show. All right. So we are live in three, two, one. Shaz! Welcome to the show, my bro. Cheers for having me. <laughs> Honoured to be here in the studio. Mate, honours all my man. So it's a bit of a weird one because we actually haven't met properly, properly, even though we've been chatting like online for about a year. It's yeah. a bit it's a bit mad, isn't it? The, the first time we saw each other was actually at like Success Resources already. Success Resources. <laughs> we saw each other and we were like, went to start speaking to each other. Within about 30 seconds, we all just both got taken away. You were a local celebrity, bro. <laughs> yeah. I think Richie <laughs> gave you a little bit of a bear head, right? Yeah, and then you got bombarded <laughs> yeah. and then we're just looking across like, yeah, we'll have to delay this meet up, man. And then the next yeah. Time we meet up is right now, man. So um, yeah, how are you, man? How's things? How I'm good, bro. Good, bro. Back in the country. Um, <laughs> back to work. That is a story in itself. Yeah. <laughs> were you like? Were, how long were you there? Because you went. You went to like um, Pakistan for like a little mini. Was it a wedding or a break? Yeah, or? I went to Pakistan for a family wedding. You know yeah. these things like three weeks. Yeah, yeah. Ended up being there for three months a little bit because <laughs> the third day we were there, lockdown happened. Yeah. yeah. So they didn't even finish the wedding properly because <laughs> it was like yeah, it's all locked down. I remember reading a post, um, <laughs> just like you just writing like, guys, I'm safe, just for anyone that did ask. And we were like, bro, I thought you were there for like three weeks. It's like three months have passed. Are you all right? Yeah. <laughs> How have you found like lockdown and stuff, man? Have it's been found- interesting. It's been, I think it's, it's interesting to see how much work I'm going to do from home. Mm. Spend more time with the kids as well. Um, yeah. just get, I'm getting more done. I think I'm a bit more productive. Yeah. But I've got fat. <laughs> yeah. Mate, a gym's <laughs> open now in Wales. They opened Monday, two days ago. So. Did they? I've been twice. My whole yeah. body's in bits. <laughs> but we'll get, there. we'll just, get there. Just don't train legs, man. Because I think if anyone trains legs now, they're going to be dead for about three you weeks. You know what? I've it? been told I'm one of the rare Asian boys that trains legs like. So yeah. it's going to happen, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no skipping leg day, man. That is, that is one of the Major takeaways key. from today. Major key. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, man. So for, for those that don't know, obviously, we'll, we'll do a little intro. Um, and for anyone that has asked a question, oh my God. I mentioned that I was getting a mortgage broker and a, a bridging finance expert. Yeah on the show and literally my inbox exploded man so i've got three pages of questions man wow. so after we get to know you a little bit better we'll uh, we'll start the interrogation man. Fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> so let's just start off with a little bit about you what you do and uh, just let people know about sort of what you specialize in and, and everything property related man That's awesome man <laughs> yeah so i am a mortgage broker property finance specialist whatever you want to call it um self-employed i work mainly with property investors so it's a lot of bridging finance development finance hmos buy to let service accommodation anything that investors do okay don't really do residential mortgages i can but i'm not that skilled in it um i've had experience working in corporate i used to work for barclays oh, okay and now the whole change from barclays to being self-employed is completely different mm. but it's a good change i think you understand more about compliance and, and procedures and processes 
working in corporate as well. Yeah. So I've been in finance now for nearly 10 years, man. Wow. It makes me feel really old, yeah. <laughs> wow, 10 years, that's a long mm. time, man. Were you doing the same role in Barclays as well? Or? Yeah, with Barclays, though, it was, more, it was more of a call centre and it was mainly residential mortgages. Okay. And also, this is the major difference is the leads were given to you, people were calling in because of Barclays. Oh, yes. Whereas now, I've had to generate business myself, so I'm doing that on social media with all the content. What made you want to switch from like Barclays to like, oh, you know what, I want to just do my own thing? What was it? They made us redundant, bro. <laughs> was it? Yeah. So what, you, they kind of like forced your sort of hand a little bit there. Yeah, yeah. They they moved all the jobs to Liverpool. Okay. Which is not even offshore. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I would have taken that. No, we got <laughs> jobs to Liverpool, right? And then we had six months gardening leave. Okay. Which is awesome, man. You get paid to do nothing, right? Yeah, yeah. I remember everyone was really worried, like, well, what are we going to do? We can't get another job now. I was like, guys, chill out. Like, you've got a qualification. See, that means something. Yes. Right? Um, you've got six months to sit around and do nothing or find a job. Yeah. It'd be all right. You know, be fine. Um, I set up the business then. So I had a, a burger restaurant, which I've just sold. Oh, Breaking yeah. news. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, so I did that. And after the six months, I was like, I'm getting a little bit restless. I need to do something. I've got this qualification. And this role came up quite close to where I live, man. Six minutes from my house. Really? To the office. That's where the office was. Yeah. So I just joined and here we are. But... It was a learning experience because it was things that we didn't really do at Barclays, like HMOs, buy to lets, investors, yes. networking. Didn't know what networking was really. Yeah. So. It's, it's weird because like I said, you know, when you become like self-employed, networking forms like a big key part of your building relationships yeah, with people. Absolutely. But when you're in a standard job, the only time you're networking is at like Christmas parties. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. you're not talking to anyone outside your office, are you? My understanding <laughs> of networking before then was like network marketing, like selling forever living or something. Okay, That's not what yeah, I thought yeah, networking yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's totally different. And I actually see you at quite a few um, networking events. I know you've done a couple of like presentations and, and sort of like key speaking stuff as well, man. So I yeah. speak at uh, Birmingham Pin every month and at Cardiff yes, Pin. Yeah. And then odds and ends everywhere else, yeah. Yeah, man. How how was that? How was that feeling from going from like the security of going to work, knowing yeah. you're going to get paid to. I've got a fend for myself and I'm out in the jungle. You know what, it was, I think I was putting it off for a while, but yeah. I knew I could do better by going out on my own. Yeah. So I was like, when's the best time? The best time is now. The more I think about it, the less I'm going to be making because I've not done it, if that makes sense. Yeah. I knew I could do it. I mean, self-confidence is there. Um, and I've always been self-sufficient in that way. So yeah, just, just, just do it. <laughs> it. It is always scary at first. Yeah. It? And the, the first sort of like six months to a year is probably your hardest. But then after that, once you start building relationships, or it's it's so much easier. Mm. Um, I'm just going to jump straight into the questions. Yeah. <laughs> cool. um, because some of these questions are just absolutely fantastic, man. So uh, big shout out to the Property Newbie community for, uh, for sending these questions in. Um, and as always, if you do want to sort of ask any of the guests any questions, then uh, yeah, man, just, just jump on the Facebook group and feel free um i think the worst thing is everyone knows who you are <laughs> so yeah. as soon as they knew you were coming on that was it like yo i wanted to ask everything that i want to ask so i'm gonna start off with yeah. a couple of sort of basic ones especially cool. for the newbies and then we'll build our sort of like way up from there so one of the first question, questions that i got asked is what is bridging for those that don't know what bridging is or are unfamiliar with the term or maybe just heard it in passing what is it and where does it primarily get used in what sort of situation? Cool. So bridging finance is generally short term finance. So normally loans from three months to maybe 24 months at most. Um, and it's where you might have a project where you're going to add value in the short term. And the intention is to either refinance or sell. Okay. Um, where you need the money quickly, such as an auction, because a mortgage can't be arranged that quickly normally. Um, or if the property is unmortgageable, so perhaps it's got knotweed or it's just a complete wreck, then you can't get a mortgage on it. Bridging finance ah. will bridge the gap before you make it mortgageable. Okay. So bridging is good for those scenarios where there's a short-term project or short-term plan and then refinance or sell on the back end. Do you, Okay, so things such as uh, like refurbishment projects, I know yeah. they're quite heavy in terms of like using bridging and stuff, but bridging... Are there any risks associated with that? Because everyone see, sees it yeah. as, okay, if I can't afford it, I can put a small deposit down, I can get a bit of bridging finance to cover the gap, and then I can just be a cash purchaser. But yeah. what are the sort of risks associated with taking bridging finance on? I suppose the risks are the project as a whole. So if your builder or developer says it's going to take nine months, it's probably going to take 12. True, so you need to make sure true. you allow for that kind of time. Yeah. Um, and cost, the same thing as cost. You know, how often do things come in on price? You've got to factor those contingencies in. True. I think, and this is where working with a broker or just having your own kind of project plan, it makes sense. So add in 10% contingency, add in three months on time. But the risks are, say you aren't able to pay it back on time. To be fair, mate, these days, lenders don't really want to repossess. It's probably the last thing they want to do. Okay. They, they should work with you to either extend the term at a cost or come to some sort of arrangement where you're paying monthly interest instead. 
you want to avoid that because if the monthly yeah. interest is a grand a month, you know, can you find that with an empty property? But the risk is, yeah, you you come to the end of your term, your project's nowhere near finished, and you're kind of stuck. Or I suppose the other risk is you've done your refer, property's ready to let out, but somehow for some reason you can't get a mortgage because the whole market has changed, lockdowns happened. Yes. And again, you're stuck on that bridge. Yeah, to- totally understandable. I mean, to be honest, one of the beauties of bridging is it lets you go in with a lot more sort of a stance on on a project. If you can go in as a cash purchaser, knowing that you can put a small deposit down, bridge the rest, and you come in and you can put an offer in. Yeah. Um, there's definitely advantages to that. Um, in terms of bridging itself, when you say um, sort of like interest and, and sort of repayment wise, what sort of interest are you talking about on the bridging loan? So just typical cost for bridging. Uh, yeah. Normally you get charged a 2% arrangement fee. That's okay. if you go through a broker. I'll be honest, if you go direct to a lender, it's normally half of that is 1%. Okay. The reason for that is from that 2%, the, bro- the lender will pay the broker half. So it's, that's the broker's kind of procuration fee on that. In terms of interest and other costs, I always say work on a rate of 1% a month for your spreadsheets. Okay. That's probably a little bit top end. But then I always say if the deal doesn't work at 1%, it's probably not a good deal be- just because of margins. Yeah. Um, other upfront costs you're going to pay is legal fees. You're going to pay for your solicitor and for the lender. These are going to be quite expensive because bridging is a bit more specialist, needs a bit more speed. Uh, valuation fees, which will depend on the purchase price of the property. And also broker fees. So again, budget a thousand pounds, but everyone's got a different business model. Some people may not even charge at all. That's bridging. When you then go into like development finance, where you're getting money for the work as well. Yeah. That's when the costs add up. Because say you wanted, let's say 50 grand for the work. Um, lenders will agree that they might say we'll give you five drawdowns of 10k each before each drawdown you've got to send them the invoices make sure you, you know, they've seen you've done the work and then they typically send an asset manager out to see the work that's there okay. for each visit it's like a charge of three four hundred quid so it's like Jeez. suddenly the costs then add up yeah Jeez, that's, that's, that's crazy I think this is one of the thing, the biggest things when it comes to using bridging and especially bridging on projects yeah. is people underestimate the additional costs like you said there the legal fees uh, the surveyor to come out you've then got to know as well what the costs are going to be associated with actually refurbing and as always if you ask a builder how long they're going to take yeah. add a bit onto that because there can be delays you don't yeah. know what's going to happen when you strip um, a sort of like a property back at what stage would you recommend people we're just dumping straight into this by the way <laughs> there's no <laughs> easy questions. dishes like, straight away no small talk uh, <laughs> at what stage would you yeah. tell someone that they need to prepare bridging in terms of like would you say okay get connections and, and get a bridging ready before you look for the project or would you look for the project and go, right, okay, now we need bridging finance and, and start the application for there? It's a strange one. I think um, generally, so mortgages are based on your circumstance and the property. Bridging is more based on the asset and the end strategy. So really anyone could get a bridging loan. Okay. You could have CCJs, be bankrupt and still get a bridging loan as long as the actual project makes sense. Oh yes, okay. So... I would say once you've seen a property, either auction listing or you've visited the property, and you've got a vague idea of what the plan is and what the end value is going to be, at that point, speak to a broker, speak to a lender, say, look, this is my plan, what kind of funding is available. Um, yeah, I mean, I think agents want to see AIPs, don't they, before they take properties off the market yeah. these days. So that's yeah. where you might need to get a quote on AIP from a, from a broker, but other than that, it's fine. Yeah, I was going to say, because when you go for sort of a, a standard like purchase, yeah. you're, you're going to a bank and they're, they're giving you a decision in principle and they're saying, right, okay, within well, the next six months, if you do find a property, we can lend you 100,000 based on your wage, blah, blah, blah. Is there anything like that with bridging or is it um, a case of just case by case? And it's case by, well, it's case by case, but also like, so yeah, residential mortgage is based on your personal circumstance, yes. your income, your expenditure, and it's the amount based on that. Bridging is just based on the property and the risk. So AIPs for bridging normally just say subject to valuation and credit approval of documents will lend you this money. And mm. that's what it is. It's not really based on your circumstances. Okay. Um, there's normally two types of bridging lenders. You've got principal lenders who lend their own money. So like rich rich kids basically lend their own money. <laughs> yeah. Or you've got non-principal who are funded by other people. It might be other banks, might be other lenders, but they've got uh-huh. a pool of funds. Okay. Generally, the ones who are lending other people's money, so non-principal, they have rate sheets because it's fixed. You, know, you can lend this money at this rate. Whereas the ones who are principal lending their own money, they don't have really fixed rates. They'll just base it on the risk and their yeah. appetite at the time. That's, that's, that's interesting because um, in terms of bridging itself, do they have a set criteria? Because I'm, I'm assuming that although you're probably likely to get accepted um, for bridging finance. Is there anything that you have to put up in terms of like securities, deposit, 
Um, what sort of criteria are they looking at when they look at you and say, right, okay, we can lend to you, but yeah. this, this, this needs to be ticked Yeah, off. so they'll look at kind of what skin you're putting in the game. So, for example, if you've got a project um, and your your deposit is going to be completely from another investor yeah, and the refund money is from another investor, they might say, well, hang on, what's your, what's your risk? You know, why are you, why are you involved in the first place? Yeah. So they want you to put some sort of skin in the game. That's the first thing. So the security is the property you're purchasing. If you want 100% funding, which I'm sure you're going to ask me about at some point, <laughs> yeah, then there's additional security you can add on and say, look, I've got this other house I want to add on. Um, but yeah, they want to see what, you, what you're doing, but they also want to see the exit strategy. So basically, if you're going to spend 20 grand on a 100 grand property and it's going to be worth 120 grand at the end, is that a good deal? Because when you refinance, you're going to get 75% back yeah. out. You're leaving a lot of money in. Now, you may be okay with that because you're like, well, hang on, it's going to make me a lot of cash flow. So as long as you're okay with it, it's fine. But they just want to understand the exit strategy and how, is that realistic? Yeah, I think even with the exit strategy, again, you've got a you've got a factor in certain margins as well. You don't want to be like, okay, as soon as I've um, I've added twenty k, bought it for a hundred, and it's worth one hundred twenty. That's like borderline. Yeah. You want a, a nice little gap there. Um, I was going to ask you this actually, in terms <laughs> of, um, but you, you kind of touched on it there. In terms of like bridging, do they allow you to take one hundred percent of the the whole de- the the refurb the development, or is it a case of you've got to have a little bit in, and not just that, it, can they? I give a little bit extra for like refurb so can you like have the whole project funded from from bridging or you is wish. that just <laughs> that would be the dream that would be yeah. the dream man now so typically right i mean every lender's got a few ups and downs but typically you get about 70 to 75 percent towards the purchase price you can get the cost of the work funded but that's always in arrears so you'll they might say two drawdowns you have to have enough money to start the work yourself but that's only if the total loan is less than 65 percent of the end value Okay. So the uplift has to be enough. So in that 120k example, probably not going to happen. But if you're going to add enough value, then it's fine. But then it's still a 30% deposit, right? The only way to get that funded is if you've got additional security. So mm-hmm. if you've got another property that you own, either with no mortgage or with a small mortgage, a lot of equity, you could say, look, for the nine months of this loan, you know, I, I'll give you a charge on that as well. That's a way of 100%. So it's 100% funding for your project. It's not 100% loan to value because your loan to value is high, uh, lower because you've got another asset yes. backed in. Yeah. So that's on the, uh, the only other way of doing it is below market, uh, sorry, open market value bridging. Okay. I'll be honest, this is very rare because you've got to find something that's genuinely below market value, right? So genuinely below, not asking price, but actually yeah. value. If the g- discount is genuine, then some lenders will lend against the true value, even if your purchase price is much lower. Okay. So if the numbers work out, you can get 100% funding that way as well. Yeah, like I said, it's quite rare. I think when I was talking to Sajah Sain, um, kind of like in between the break, and I think he mentioned it on uh, the podcast as well, he said yeah. it's actually, we're not in a market to find a lot of below market value properties, although everyone sort of wants to find yeah. it's, it's Saudi unicorn. gold, but yeah, it, <laughs> yeah. it's so difficult. Um, one thing that I came across, um, and you might be able to shed some light onto this, is um, when I was obviously looking at a bridging project, I actually reached out to yourself and, yeah. and gave you some sort of numbers and stuff. Um, in terms of bridging to obviously make it profitable for them, is there a minimum that they would want to lend out and not go below that? Because going to a bridge and, and, and asking for 10, 20,000, is, is that even worth it for them? Or Because I know I had a barrier um, around sort of 30, 40, where they were like, mm, I don't probably know. It'll probably worth it for them because they're also going to charge you those fees anyway. But 10, 20 grand, get a personal loan. Um, True. Generally, minimum property value is 50K and the loan is 70% of that. Okay. So 37,500. I know there's I know there's one or two lenders who'll go lower than that if you go directly to them, and I can get you in touch with them if you want to go that low. But again, sub 50, sub thirty five k borrowing, you may as well get private investors because the fees on that will make it not worthwhile for you. So lenders Very doesn't care. True. Lenders gonna make their money, but it's is it gonna add up for you if the fees are a couple of grand? That's true. I think like you said there, then if you're if you're going in with a smaller amount, sort of like you like you said, you're thirty forty k. Either are there other options available? Like you said, yeah. other investors personal loans as well you, personal or you could get a second charge against your house if, you, if you're a homeowner True. to secure against so that it's only a 10 month project you're going to pay it back anyway so. yeah 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 that's that, that's very smart man especially as well by the way for personal loan rates are just ridiculous it's, it's unsecured it's quick it you know. basically although this is not financial advice this is <laughs> you're not fca regular bro. <laughs> i know this is this is not don't sue me um 
But the, the 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 personal loans at the moment are just the rates are just ridiculous. It yeah. basically just feels like free money. Like yeah. it is, yeah, yeah. they're just ridiculous low. Something like three percent. Some of them, it's just it's crazy. Um, one of the questions that I know a lot of newbies are gonna sort of be curious about, and myself included in that. Um, obviously, refurbishment projects are is an area I definitely want to go down. Buy yeah. refurb, refinance, all of that. Um, do you need to have a company set up to apply for bridging or can you do it as an individual? You can do it as an individual. I guess speak to an accountant around your end goals because if you do it in an individual, then when you refinance, keep it as an individual. Is that going to be okay for you? You could put it in the company at that point, but yeah. it's a purchase. Yeah. So you're going to be stamped at you and so on at that point. Okay, so okay. So start how you need to go on. But yeah, either way is fine. Yeah, because there's always that debate because a, uh, a lot of newbies and a lot of people in, uh, that are sort of like joining the game, they might start off wanting to do service accommodation, rent to rent, all of that, and then they switch to buy refurbishment later down the line and it's just a case of weighing up is it going to be worth doing it in a company or is it going to be worth doing it in uh, as an individual? Speak to a qualified professional. Speak yeah, to an accountant. Yeah, yeah, man. I, yeah, stay, yeah. I stay in my lane. I'm working <laughs> finance, that's it. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting point, man. Um, okay, i got a couple more questions, man. Like I said, sorry. But yeah. everyone, we, we just went in straight away. <laughs> Hit you a quick fire, man. Um, okay. Actually, one that I will reach out to uh, in no particular order, by the way. Um, Obviously, you do, you're a broker as well. Yeah. Uh, although residential is not your sort of thing, you, you go down other paths. What's the advantages of going to you versus going to a traditional bank for any sort of lending? Um, you know, it depends on, on, on what you're doing. So if, if what you're looking for, whether it's residential or vital, if it's pretty mainstream, pretty kind of clean cut and vanilla, you may just go direct to a lender and you, you, there might be better for you. But it's kind of like a, with a broker, we can research the whole market and just understand from your criteria and your needs what works for you. So if you went to Barclays, um, and let's say Lloyd's had a better rate, they're not going to tell you. They're not going to say, no. oh, listen, listen <laughs> girl, go down the road and, you know, they don't, they're not going to do that. That's not how they work. So with a broker, they can guide you through that. And also a big part of my job, man, is like I'm, I'm a counsellor and a firefighter. Like <laughs> things will come up as part of the application. Actually, the client never knows about because I've dealt with it. So there's a okay. lot of that happening as well. Um, I suppose you go direct to a lender. There's working hours. They're going to work nine to five, maybe not any weekends. Yes. I'm on my phone working until like 11 p.m. most yeah, nights. Yeah. So is that service? But again, it depends. So with mortgages, I think if you really know what you want and if you've done your money supermarket comparison and you feel comfortable that you can handle nine to five service, you don't want anything else, then yeah, go direct to lender, man. I'm not going to push you. Yeah. I think with bridging, though, there's probably literally over 100, more than 100 bridging lenders, probably too many. I think some of them should just merge with each other because <laughs> there's no USBs. They all just do the same thing. Okay. But with bridging, yeah, definitely, because there's no specific rates, there's no criteria like we discussed earlier, you should go to a broker because then you might, you know, you might miss out on a deal. Yeah, it's it's sort of like finding that balance in it about sort of like positives. One thing that you picked up on there, which is so true, obviously, when I was doing my own sort of like standard residential purchase, yeah. nine to five, Monday, Friday, outside of those hours, your bank just does not want to know. Yeah. They might drop you an email just to update you, but it's not like I can reach out to them, yeah. uh, which is obviously different from a broker. And I think what's nice about using a broker, which I, I will definitely consider on in my next purchase is, as you mentioned, you're sort of like you're, you're looking at the whole market and seeing what is the best rate that you can get. Yeah. Um, and like I said, you're always sort and of I think it's, it's aside from rate as well, it's like criteria. So for example, yeah. uh, Again, moving on to buy to let, you know, some lenders want you to be a homeowner, some lenders don't care, some lenders want you to have this. You have you will not understand that as a client, whereas a broker will understand and filter through. So only give you present you the rates that you're eligible for. Yeah. Because there's nothing worse than going through half an application and suddenly turn around going, You don't qualify because of X. In terms of just taking it back just a little bit, in terms of bridging, have yeah. you ever had any sort of like horror stories related to it in terms of like, I don't know, people Fate, like the, something wrong with the development not being able to pay it back anything like that have you had any sort of stories or experiences with that um, I've, had a, I've had a bad experience last year I mean when it comes to failed developments I think it rarely happens or if it does happen as long as you tell the lender early enough they'll just extend your term with yeah. a fee and that's kind of okay but I've had one before the money even came to the client was a nightmare so what happened was these clients had two applications going through with the same lender okay same bridging lender and I've got a good relationship with this lender. I thought, you know, these are my boys. Let's just put these through, you know, yeah. good relationship, get it through. Now, property one, the underwriter was being really, really, I guess, overcautious, saying, look, it looks like there's a flying freehold on this property. We, you need some sort of insurance. I'm not happy with this property. 
It took ages. Now, eventually, the clients got this sort of indemnity insurance policy, even though their solicitors and the vendor solicitor, look, there's no flying freehold. It's because you're buying all three flats. Mm. But that was going through on one side, right? That was going through really slowly. On the other hand, their second property, uh, the one that they were buying, the vendor, the guy who was selling, was in a lot of debt. So he actually ended up having charging orders on the property. Now, they're not legal charges, but the orders to say that if you sell, you have to pay us first. Mm. But they're not legal charges, so there's a slight difference. Mm. Um, when we told the clients that, they're like, Shaz, look, our solicitor is telling us that he's, he's had this before, um, and there is a way around it. Once we get the money from the lender, we can just proceed and pay those, you know, the charging orders will get removed. I thought, that's fine. If the solicitor's told them that, the qualified yeah. professional, I'll carry on like. Um, eventually, the client said, look, for this second project with the charging orders, we, we don't want to push ahead with it. It's maybe too much of a risk. Maybe there's more that we'll find out. Let's just finish that one. With the first property now, we were it was going to complete on Friday. And I'm, I'm in the gym car park on a mm. Tuesday, right? And my client's from the gym. So I get an email from the MD of this company saying, Hi, guys, um, I've just been reviewing your overall case. And we need to have a chat. Because you're so adamant on pushing through property two with the charging orders, we now think you're a risk in terms of lending. We'll still lend you this money, but what we want is to take another charge on this other property that you own in the background. You are joking. Now, this wasn't my best moment, mate. So I, I called I called the lender. I called the managing director of this company. And we were on the phone at like 15, 20 minutes. I said, look, this is, this is ridiculous. Like, what do you expect me to tell my clients? How are you justifying this? What has one got to do with the other? They're not going ahead with this anyway. Mm. He's like, yeah, no, we've just, we've just reviewed it. And we think because of the risk, we want to take another charge. Um... And I, I just couldn't believe it. And I think this is like the worst. This is old school bridging where they just want to take a charge and then take your assets off you. Yeah. That's what people hear the horror stories about. Yeah. I've never come across it before. They did it in the end. They had to because they paid all the legal fees. They paid all the fees. It was so it, it was complete in three days You know afterwards. Um, and I mean, yeah, I'm not in the lender's good books anymore, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah, but that's like a bridge that you've had to burn or been burnt on your burnt side without, with, with, <laughs> but without your um without your being your sort of fault i mean you're that deep in the process and then all of a sudden they're sort of like sort of like pulling the sort of it's like, because they know you're financially committed you've paid yeah. like well they've paid legal fees on both projects anyway this one didn't go ahead they're still paid on that if you want us to go ahead you've got to give us another charge and that's and the thing is because it's unregulated they can do it they shouldn't yeah. but it's it's an unregulated business so so was all of this paid and then they needed the bridging to continue or was the terms already agreed? And then terms they agreed. So they, so they, was, changed the, was... they, they changed the terms after they signed the How, documents. Can you do that? It's like, it's, yeah, it's unregulated. <laughs> they crazy. can, yeah. Because yeah. I was just thinking, like, if you're that far in, you probably would have agreed all of the numbers and figures and lending and everything and then to, to pull that on you three days in. Jeez. Absolute nightmare. Yeah. And, and you know what the worst thing is? When you're in a project like that and you're focusing on every single penny... You cannot account for something like that yeah. to just literally just that could wipe people out. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That is that is insane. And then you had to deal with it. <laughs> and I, I, got, I went to the gym. I was like, "Hey guys, have you seen this email?" They're like, "Which email?" I was like, "Let's have a read it together." Like, <laughs> and they're all pumped on pre-workout. And I was like, oh god. <laughs> <laughs> she just gone to the office. Didn't <laughs> yeah. That is crazy because I think that's that sort of like Bridgin's pictured in some respects. If you haven't been through the processes, quite a nice way to eventually own the asset which I'll, I'll ask you a question about in a second and and sort of have a little bit of a deposit but be able to leverage that position up by using lending to then buy out yeah. and then you'll 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 add value to it but there is situations like you said like this where you do need to be a bit overly cautious do you know what i mean i mean if, yeah and this is where things i think and this is where maybe using a broker again although i placed them with that lender but perhaps yeah. I'll, I'll never use them again for example yeah it's understanding you know how reputable is a lender yeah how well, have they actually got the money? Are they yeah. struggling? That kind of thing. I think it, it's it's a case of like you're able to sort of like there are people are able to use your friendships and your relationships yeah. if if you know someone. But um, man, I can't I can't even imagine what that <laughs> that, that, that person must yeah. be feeling. Um, go, I've got I've got a question actually, which is kind of related to that in, in some respects. Um, I've had a question come in from uh, Vasco, so thank you very much. Um, it's when you're going through bridging. Um, at what point, and let's just say you don't want to sell it for profit, you want to eventually just yeah. transition to pull your money out and, and switch it to a buy to let. What's the sort of process in regards to that in terms of at what stage do you switch over to uh, a buy to let mortgage and eventually go down that route? Cool. So I would say 
get in touch with your broker or if you're going to a lender directly, just get in touch maybe two or three weeks before the property's ready to be finished. Get the application in because they're going to call you for the valuation anyway. You can arrange it as soon as you know it's going to be finished. So start the process two or three weeks before. Okay. Before okay. the property is ready and finished to be valued. So just remember the value is going to value what you see on the day. Yeah. So it needs to be ready to let out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So literally wait till a couple of weeks before the sort of like the, the value comes around yeah. and then it's a case of... And because okay. they, like I say, because they're going to call you to arrange the access, you could say, oh yeah, that'll be next week or the week after and that's fine. Okay, okay. Uh, is, it, is it quite a quick process after that? In terms of... Yeah, um, well, I'll say quick. I mean, lenders, I think all lenders are struggling right now. They're all a little bit slow. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, generally, you, once you've submitted the application, on one hand, they'll do the underwriting. On the other hand, there's a valuation. In theory, together, they should then offer the case. Yeah. Like two weeks, three weeks after. Oh, that's not bad, though. It's not bad. I, I mean, we can, we can just talk about this now. It's a little bit off topic, man. But how are you viewing the, the sort of property market at the moment? Are you still staying busy? Are you still finding that there's buyers? Is it still a buyer's market? Because it's, it's a bit of a weird feeling because every time I walk down a street within a week, two weeks, three weeks, it's gone. Like, or an office has been yeah. put in. And I can't fathom it because of our economic situation. It's crazy. Officially in a recession. Um, I think it's a seller's market, but I think buyers are buying, if, that's, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I think prices are slightly inflated, especially yeah. where I am in South Wales. But yeah. they're still selling for those prices. Yeah. Um, I've seen auctions sell Bond Wolf and SDL. Prices are going mad, and, but they're selling. That's like no stock is being left. I wonder why that is. I like think I people said, are maybe hedging their bets with what's going to happen with the economy and everything else in the market and just want to buy some assets. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a weird one because hedging your bets, I would assume that you would wait for it to, to drop so you can buy the dip yeah. to move forward because I don't understand it. You've had a, <laughs> an economic event which has just crushed every single business. You've got people that will eventually, and this may or may not be true, I think they'll if, if you're losing your jobs, you're going to default on your mortgage, man. You may get more renters, but... I see, I see people selling and being in dire situation and then all of a sudden you've got all these people that have just come out of nowhere with cash unless maybe they've, they've got already back loans <laughs> that is my next <laughs> question from you are on it today man um unless like I said these are people that have seen that this recession is coming and thought well we need to start stacking up cash two three years before it's the happened the weird thing about this recession is it's not like the last one so the last one was there there was a shortage of money mm, mm. whereas now it's not that it's more there's a pandemic going on yeah the money's still floating around it's just access to it might be more limited true and i thought in some respects which kind of mentioned there's uh, uh, lenders being a little bit more hesitant about people's financial situations yeah. that comes to all aspects loans mortgages everything um they don't want to be in a situation where they actually end up being like the last recession where they can't literally can't get their money back yeah. i've had a question coming on and you just touched on that point um so i've had a question coming from uh dil nashin so thank you very much dil nashin um she's asked how do lenders view you using the bounce back loan for property purchases and and property investments and also, what's your opinion on that? Uh, no a, one as cares a, what my opinion is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I care, man. We'll, we'll cut that bit out. We'll, what his opinion So, uh, <laughs> no, my, my opinion is, I think if, if your business is struggling, whether that's a property business or not, um, and you need to bounce back, then you take the loan. Yeah. I think my opinion on it is that the f- access to that money is a bit too easy mm. because they're lending you money mm. based on your projected turnover. Mm. So you could say it's going to be 250K, and get a 50 grand loan without any True. real due diligence on it. Yeah. Um, and through a limited company, there's no, per- you're not even given a personal guarantee on it. So it's a little too easy to access. And it reminds me of the old interest only mortgages where you could just sign to say you, you'll do yeah. something and you get that money. So that's that. In terms of what lenders are thinking, so it is softening a little bit. Uh, so last week, Shorebrook Bank have said that they're okay with bounce back loans being used as deposit as long as the company taking the loan is the one that's applying for the mortgage. Okay, so you couldn't apply yes. in like my restaurant business and take the mortgage that way. As long yeah. as it's in the same business, they're okay with that. Most lenders still are pretty much like case by case, but generally it's a no. The rationale is that you've kind of just declared that your business is struggling, therefore you want the loan. We don't want to lend you if, if you're a struggling business. But I think it is softening and it is case by case. I've had two cases put through with bounce back loans, partially as a deposit and they've been fine. Bridging lenders, again, are more flexible. Mm. End of the day, they want to see what input you're putting in. So if all your money is a bounce back loan, then it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you've taken 50 grand and that's, that's your input, not going to happen. But I've had clients who've taken eight grand because his development, his bridging lender was being struggling. 
So he took eight grand just to fill the gap. And that's that's been fine because there's a real reason for it. Yeah. Um, I think you also got to bear in mind with the BBLs is if you took 50K and after 12 months, the payment's about 820 quid a month. It's a lot, man. You've got to invest that wisely yeah. to make that money back each yeah. month, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think it, it all comes back to, again, as you mentioned, what's the risk on the other side in terms of whether it be bridging or otherwise. And especially with bridging, one consistent theme that I see is that they want you to have skin in the game because without it, all of their sort of leverage is on them. They may as well purchase it yeah, themselves. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> They're not really sort of like gaining in that respect. Um, and that's interesting what you say about sort of bounce back loans. And at the moment, it, you know, like you said, if they're, if they're softening up, that's quite nice to see, um, especially with a lot of us in the, the property sort of like sector struggling, especially those who've got SAs and HMOs. A lot of them are covering, using it to cover up the rent and stuff. But, but and that, that's okay. So yeah, I've had a few where they've taken bounce back loans but the deposit is separate money they've had anyway. And that's okay. Yeah. It's only if the bounce back loan's been used for the deposit. Yeah. That's where it's a question mark. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, they're, used, they're doing it sort of like case by case. Um, talking about case by case. Yeah. Um, actually, before we get on to it, I've got, I've, got an, <laughs> okay. I've got an amazing question by uh, Matthew, which I'll, I'll come on to. Um, I've had a question come in. Um, what are mortgage rates like at the moment? And are you finding that they've stayed fairly consistent? Are they dropping? Are they increasing? And this is for like property purchases. Uh, it's interesting. So I've noticed that rates on a personal purchase, so in your personal name for mm. buy to let, are ridiculously low, probably as low as they've been. However, the rates, if you're doing this with a limited company, have shot right up. Um, ah, okay. There's a big, big difference now. So you could get a two-year fixed in your personal name for about, I think it's five-year fixed, sorry, 2.02% in a personal Jeez. name. Whereas the equivalent on a, on a limited company, you're looking at like 4% now. Wow. It's a massive difference. So again, yeah. speak to your accountant about your plan. Yeah. But I'm not sure if it even makes sense to do it in a company at this stage. Yeah, that's because I was, I was thinking that because obviously when I came to remortgage um, this house, obviously it was, I went from, I, I was just a complete newbie when it came to property man. So uh, initially my first uh, mortgage was at like 3%, which at the time was still expensive. And then obviously when I came to remortgage it, I was like, yo, this is like 2%. Yeah. Um, and like I said, the economy hasn't changed. So for it to, to be sort of still at that rate. But what's interesting is if you do it through a company, it's up to like 4%. It's a lot more. And the fees are higher. The legal fees are higher. And you're still given a personal guarantee anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I've been trying to find, I'm trying to think why would that be? Uh, because is it costing the lender more to lend to you as a company? Probably not. Not yeah. that much more. Yeah, yeah. But at the end of the day, it's their money, their rules, isn't it? That's, that's what we got to say. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting, that. I, I, I don't... Do you think it's related to a, an increase in people purchasing through the company, or do you just think it's something on the back end which we, um, we don't I know just about? Think, yeah, I think it's an increase in company purchases. They want to make their money back. Mm. So this, it's more of a profit thing rather than anything else. Damn. So I didn't I did not know that. Four <laughs> percent. I know. On a five year fix, yeah, maybe three point five on a two year But fix. even so even like, that's that's a lot higher than But you, the the difference between like a, a percent and a half can be ridiculous when it comes back to paying interest back yeah. on your uh, your monthly payments. Mm -hmm. Um Right, so I've got a question come in from uh Fayaz. Uh, yes. shout out Fayaz. Fayaz asks a question like every week and I, I always forget this. to shout yeah. I always forget <laughs> to shout about so Fayaz, this is a special thank you. And uh, also thanks for the question as well, big man. Um so this is just more of a personal situation with him. So just a little insight from yourself. So he's looking at purchasing some flats. Yep. Uh, every time he goes to purchase a flat, um, he always gets issue, issues with getting a I'm mortgage. I'm smiling because I read this on Facebook. <laughs> I like, yeah. oh, poor guy. <laughs> I know. He always gets issues with a, a mortgage, whether it be um, it got rejected. What some of the reasons it got rejected because it was on the sixth floor, uh, is near a shopping center apparently, um, one that used to be a factory, so we can't let you take a mortgage out on it. Um, is he missing something there or is it just, is he using a well, broker? Well, in his words, <laughs> his broker is not a potato, he's <laughs> not a spud, all right? Um, so lenders will look at things when it comes to flats or any property. Mm. Uh, is it next to adjacent or opposite commercial? Because if it is, that may affect the resale value. Yeah. What kind of commercial is it? Is it a kebab shop? That will probably have a major effect. Is it like a nail salon? Probably not a big deal. So that's, a, that's one of those things next to a commercial. Is it a purpose-built flat? Is it converted? If it's been converted, has it got the relevant insurances? Same as the new builds. Uh, if it's on the sixth floor, has it got a lift? This may not ah, have a that's lift. What it is. Okay. is it ex-council? So there's all these things they'll look at. I'm, I imagine if I has told his broker all of this and he's filtered through the lenders. It's a difficult one. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not going to say which lender. I don't know which lender specifically. But yeah, there's a lot. To, with flats, you've got to look at, is it council? Let's say, is it high-rise? Has it got a lift? Deck access in London, that causes a problem. Okay. Yeah, lenders don't really like that. 
They don't like it. No. Why? Because anyone could go into each other's properties kind of with a deck access. Very true. That's crazy. Because originally, when I read this question, I was like, oh, this sounds a bit ridiculous. But the obviously, o- the there's, other there's one that comes up as well, actually, as well, sorry to cut off, is um, is there demand for owner occupier? So, say it's a, it's a flat with 30, 30 units, right? If 25 of them are owned by other investors, that could get you zero value because the lender could say, well, there's no demand for owner occupier. If we had to repossess and sell, mm. uh, someone else isn't going to buy it. That can be mm. an issue as well. Wow, that's that's crazy. That's just that's a massive eye opener because, to be honest with you, I've always looked at apartments because mm. there's always a bit of a demand from, especially in the city centre. But I mean, Birmingham city centre at the moment for apartments has just shot up ridiculously. It's all that essay stuff, all isn't it? All that <laughs> SA stuff, which is a question I was literally just going to ask you. So, um, for anyone that does uh, do service accommodation, I know we're sort of like jumping around a little bit here, but um, it's something that I saw a post on. I think by yourself. Um, a lot of people are doing service accommodation. However, they may not necessarily be checking the mortgage terms on the landlord side or yep. whoever's taking the mortgage out. What sort of how how can they how can they get sort of past this and how can they get sort of permission from the lender or how are they breaching the mortgage if they just continue doing a, a yeah. service accommodation? Um, so yeah, there's two things you should check. If it's an apartment or a flat, then you should check the head lease and that'll tell you if short term let is permitted or not. Mm. That's not to do with the mortgage, that's just the rules of the apartment and the freehold. So you don't want to be breaching that. When it comes to the mortgage, um, I would say 99% of standard buy to let mortgages will specify you have to have an AST for 6 or 12 months. Yeah. Anything shorter is short term let. Okay, so that's the breach. Lenders don't want to have guests, they want tenants in because it gives them more comfort that there's going to be rental coming in. I've, uh, I've had a client actually, end of end of the year before last, so nearly two years ago now, um, he took out a mortgage. I wasn't aware. He took out a mortgage and started putting an Airbnb. Oh. Lender didn't know that. But because he didn't send in his ASTs as part of the mortgage application and as part of their due diligence after the mortgage was completed, mm. they checked on the usual whatever checks they do when they found the property on Airbnb. So they wrote to him and said, look, we can see you're doing this. Um, we don't allow this. You need to stop. Or you need to pay, I think it was like £6,000 early repayment charge and Jeez. find another lender. Yeah. What would you do, by the way, on that? Would you stop doing it or would you pay the charge? Depends how much I'm making. Exactly. So he paid the charge. Like, Shaz, I'm making a ton of money on this. Yeah. Find me a lender that will be happy with this and I'll just pay the DLC. And he did. So lenders will can find out. I'm not saying they always will, but they can. Um, but interestingly, there's a lot of products now for short-term lets. Okay. So, yeah, if you're speaking to a landlord, like if you're doing rent to service accommodation, speak to a landlord, you know, ask them who the mortgage is with. Um, again, how much can you push your landlord? You, but just say, look, it's, you know, you need to make sure that your mm. mortgage lender is comfortable and knows that you're doing short term mm. lets. In terms of that process, um, is, are the mortgages quite, are they, are they sort of quite flexible in that respect? So if they do say, well, look, so a, a landlord goes to a, their, their mortgage provider and says, I want to change. Are they sort of open to that or is it just like a standard, whatever they've done before, they'll carry on? Or if yeah, not, that's so it, we won't even know it. if you're in a fixed rate, then they'll say, fine, we don't allow this. You've got to pay the early repayment charge, like I said before, uh, and find another lender. They mm. might say you've got three months to do that, mm. but you can't let it out until then. Oh, do they? Yeah, yeah, only because <laughs> it's, it's, it's outside their contract agreement, isn't it? Yeah. And you're telling them you're breaching their contract. So lenders aren't that flexible unless... I suppose unless they're already with a lender that does also the short-term lets and standard lets, mm. then they might say, yeah, that's fine, crack on. But it's very unlikely. Yeah, it's this is always that. I always imagine people are not on the right mortgage products because yeah. you see all this on social media. That 100%. But... The amount of times that I've seen someone <laughs> put a post up with like a, a letter slapped on their door saying no Airbnb allowed, blah, blah, blah. And then what they took on as a service accommodation unit, they end up having to just do it as a standard lit and not yeah. even break even. And that's the thing. I mean, and we spoke about this off camera. It's like, look, I know you, you could say, yeah, it's a landlord's responsibility or whatever, but it's your cash flow. So if something yeah. does go wrong, you're losing out as well. Yeah. So kind of work together with your landlord. I've had another question come in um, and you've kind of touched on it briefly. I know when we were speaking about bridging, you kind of touched on this point, but uh, it's a question from Neil. Uh, so big up Neil. Um, he's asked for a newly self-employed individual who hasn't even had one year's worth of accounts yet, is it still possible to get bridging? It depends on your exit strategy, I suppose. So if your exit is to flip or sell, mm. it doesn't really matter what you do for a living because you, it doesn't come into it. Yeah. If your exit is to refinance on the back end, then you should ask yourself a question, can I get a mortgage? 
as I am. Yeah. So there's plenty of mortgage buy to let mortgage lenders who don't have a minimum income requirement. So you could be earning five hundred pound a year and it's fine, but they do require some sort of income that's evidenced. Mm. So if you've just gone self-employed, you've got no income on the books, you've got no other income at all, it might be difficult. I have placed a case before where this lady had zero income, she was unemployed, but she'd just been gifted like 300 grand from a dad for sale of the business. Yeah. So from that perspective, there's no risk to a lender because she could cover voids and repairs because she's got 300 yeah, grand in her yeah, account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I guess it's then it's like, have you got anything in savings? Have you got any substantial amount that if there were voids or repairs, a lender's comfortable they could lend to you based on that? It's interesting... Um, position that because after a, a flip a lot of people say well I don't want to sell uh, not, uh, after a refurb sorry a lot of people yeah. say I don't want to I don't want to sell I just want to have that asset you've pulled all your money out you've basically potentially in some cases bought a house for like 10k or less yeah um why would you want to sell it um but on the back end of that like you said if they don't have a, a job or any sort of income coming in are you how would a mortgage provider look at you and your business especially if it hasn't been trading for too long or even if you're self-employed how will they look at that and judge whether you're yeah. uh, at risk or not? Uh, it, so this is some of the things lenders are asking now since lockdown uh, up front is, you know, can you cover voids and repairs? Do you have anything set aside? So I say mm. to people now, try and keep like six months mortgage payments in a bank account just so we can say there's that. Yeah. So you could be unemployed or technically no income that you can evidence, right? Uh, but if you had money in savings set aside, that would be enough comfort for a lender to say you're a, you own a property yeah. because you've, yeah. just done, you've just done that bridge. So you own a property, you're a homeowner, You've got no income, but you've got substantial savings set aside. Yeah. That could be a case to package together, but don't go on a bridge without that being locked in. So yeah. I would then do a mortgage decision in principle first before you go to the bridge. Smart move, yeah. Get that first so then you know when the time comes and you're in that situation, you've already got something. That's that is yeah. I'm making note of that. Or I mean what you could do again with some lenders, they're okay with no income. Um, but you could get maybe once your project's finished, get tenants in for a month. Mm. So now you've got one month's rental income on a bank statement. And then go to that Very one. smart. Dude, you're, you're just giving away gold, man. I feel like I'm going to start charging <laughs> people for this podcast, you know, to watch it. Um, that is class. Um, and just off the back of that, actually, um, just a question from myself, because I know this might reflect a lot of people, especially that are jumping in the property game and all of a sudden they want to leave and say, wow, yeah. I want to focus on property full time. I'm going to uh, change, change my LinkedIn change, bio. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you, you have the profile yeah. picture now with the quote next to it saying, yeah. I can give investors returns and that. Um, <laughs> But when it comes to standard purchases and the only thing that you have is your business, how what will lenders look at in terms of if they do want to lend to you in terms of giving you a mortgage and things like that? What will they look at? Because a lot of people, are, I think, especially with this a new wave that are coming through, a lot of them are thinking, right, I want to do this full time. And a lot of them are smashing it. A lot of them have still got a long way to go. But how will lenders view you? Uh, do you mean like residential mortgage? Yeah, right? just, just residential. Yeah, I think with residential, it, it is income based. So mm. you, it's, and it's income that you can evidence. So you could say, well, I've been doing self-employed for six months and you know, I've got loads of income coming in. The evidence for that is your tax returns, tax calculations, but they're yeah. not going to be generated from those six months. So yeah, it's going to be difficult. You're not going to have to just wait, maybe increase your deposit in that time. But mm. yeah, until you can evidence your self-employed income on a tax return with a tax year overview, lending will be difficult because you've got no income that you could show to base it on. Yeah, I thought as much. Like I said, uh, at some point as well um, in the future, man, like uh, a lot of us will have that, that issue, especially if you've already got one house and then decided to go yeah. sort of like uh, and do your own thing. Um, I've had, to, I've got two questions left from we, we have smashed through these right now. So they're <laughs> cool. amazing answers. Um, I've had a question coming from uh, Benjamin Brown. So yeah. uh, big up Benjamin. He'll be on the podcast at some stage as well, man. Um, What's the difference between bridging finance and development finance? Um, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of both? Um, it's just words, I think. So, yeah, development finance is anywhere where you're also lending money for work to the property. Development, I guess, could mean more larger projects where you're building up units and, you know, selling some off. But, yeah, it's just when you're getting money for the work, also called refurbishment finance as well. Okay. So we touched on it earlier. Development finance does attract a lot more costs because you have regular site visits, asset managers and all sorts of things. Bridging finance, I, I always say if you can afford to do the work yourself, just do the bridge, mm -hmm. pay for the work yourself. You need to evidence to a lender that you've got that money in a bank account though. Yeah. Um, just want to mention as well in terms of bridging, just sidetrack slightly, is source of deposit. Yeah. So with mortgages, your deposit needs to be your own money, uh, gifts from family, or money from your business, i.e. directors and shareholders. When it comes to bridging, they're quite flexible. So you can have your own money, 
guests from family and friends, or if you've got investors, they're okay with that as long as there's a loan agreement and unless the, the investor has no charge on the property as well. Ah, okay. So you can do that as well. But the key thing is when you come to then remortgage, you have to be making sure you're clearing the investor yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. Is it, that's, that comes back into having your exit strategy because one exit's of the exit's key. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> one of one of the things that you said to me when I asked you a couple of questions on bridging is that you need to work backwards. Is you see the property and the end value, you work backwards in terms of all the costs, all the time, all the legals, yeah. everything, and then how much your deposit and bridging will be. And doing it that way might also help you figure out if you can negotiate on the purchase price or reduce your cost of the work because yeah. it's not going to be worth more than that at the end anyway. Yeah. Can you get to that? in a more cost-effective way. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that I've had come in is from uh, Matthew. So uh, big shout out, Matthew. It's a bit of a long question, man. Epic so I was question. going to write it down, but it would take about a page in it. So I'm just going to read it off my phone. Uh, thank you very much for the question, Matt. It sounds amazing, by the way. Um, so just reading it just as he's sort of like written it. So he goes, uh, he'll soon or hopefully be requiring bridging for one of his properties. He goes, it's a fairly large property with several buildings. Uh, there's a barn which requires development and planning permission. Uh, the property will put in, will be put into an SPV, him and the vendor. Um, and he wanted to get the development or bridging loan to complete the work so he can get a mortgage. Um, and then the properties may be split into titles too to pay off the uh, all the, to keep the property and pay off all the bills, including the deposit mortgage, which is pretty standard. Um, he goes, I'll need 100% of the loan, but the GDV should be larger than what the purchase price and the refurb cost is. Um, he says, bless him, he says he's not quite ready yet, but have you got any tips on how um, he could prepare for this or how we could structure the deal? So there's yeah. quite a few little things in that. So, yeah, what Matthew's doing is a form of what they call vendor finance. Okay. So by going in with the vendor, the vendor is kind of, in a way, financing part of the deposit. And that, that is another way of getting 100% funding by getting a vendor on board. Okay. Um, and what you could offer the vendor is some sort of profit share at the end when you refinance and add value. So with the vendor in the company, in essence, the bridging lender could lend against the full value, but the vendor could agree a sale at a lower purchase price. Mm. There is going to be stamp duty involved because it's a new entity, a new SPV purchasing. What Matthew will also have to do is when he comes to refinance is just get the vendor to resign from the company as a, as a director or shareholder. Ah, okay. Because when, when he's on the mortgage, it just needs to be Matthew. Yes. I mean, keep him on if he wants, but I doubt he wants to do that. <laughs> yeah. But I guess all this needs to be agreed with solicitors up front. Mm. Um, but yeah, 100%, 100% funding is available on that one because the vendor is given a discount essentially with the equity that he's gifting. <sighs> Uh, it's a good project, that. That is, it does sound amazing. I said to Matthew, I was like, where is it? He goes, yeah, in South Wales. I was going to say, like, where exactly in South Wales? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I'd be interested in that. But if it needs planning, does it have planning or need planning? I think it needs planning. So when it comes to funding then, you'll typically get a bridging loan first just to buy the, buy the site or the property. Mm. Then as soon as you get planning granted, that's when you get the development funds. Yes. Because you don't get planning, they're not going to, what are they going to fund for? 100%. It, it, it does sound like an amazing project. Yeah. That advice is class as well. Like when you've got multiple things moving at the same time like that, like you said, get the um, get the person on, get them to resign so that it's just you on the mortgage. I mean, that's smart. Uh, one man. of these, I'd always say, maybe have a conference call with the solicitor, the accountant and the broker just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Yes. Maybe, maybe even the lender, the underwriter, just to say, look, this is what we're going to structure. Is everyone okay with that? Yeah. Because then afterwards, you can't have anyone complaining saying they didn't know. Yeah, yeah it, do, it does sound like a, an unreal uh, project, man. Dude, I just want to say, man, thank you so much. No but I want to know a little bit, just before we obviously yeah. wrap up this, because you, it's been like an hour of just like <laughs> pure gold, man. Um, what does the future hold for you, man? What are you up to? Tell us a little bit about you and, and, and what you're doing in, in your sort of like life so, and property and everything, man. Yeah, so I mean, I've just sold my business. I had a gourmet burger restaurant. Amazing. But it was keeping me too busy, I think. So the agreement always was I was going to be the active partner because it was whilst I was being redundant, I had more time. Yeah. But I'm too busy being the finance guy. <laughs> so yeah. I've just sold my share in that now. Mm -hmm. So I've got a bit of money, got more time. Uh, my dad said, you know, shall we, Johnny, what are you going to do now? It's like, not another job. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm going to start doing some more property stuff. What that is, who knows yet, but I'm looking into options for that. Mm. Um, and in terms of what I'm doing in terms of as a, as a broker, I think the next step really is to branch out a bit more. Scale, but in the right way. Um, I had a period, so like, when I went to Pakistan, I got someone else to do my admin. Normally I do it myself. Yeah. I'm really hands-on. Uh, and the feedback was, Shaz, you know, it was okay, but it wasn't how you do it. Yeah. Because, you know, you kind of give us the attention and the service. So I need to maybe find someone who um, 
loves it as much as I do in Germany. <laughs> you do add a personal touch to it. Like, yeah, I yeah. mean, you obviously like, we know each other from social media. I mean, it's crazy. We're both obviously in property and then I got to know you, but everyone in like, obviously the property newbie group and there's a property community, anyone can reach out to you. You're always giving advice. You'll always comment on posts and you'll always, even we, dude, you get tagged way too much. <laughs> you little bit too much. <laughs> get, get told off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to the point where I don't even know how you just don't turn your phone off and yeah. go, right, okay. <laughs> but that's the thing. See, I think, you know, I think I'm always available and accessible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I'm always giving it away. I think that's the other thing yeah. as well. Is there's, no, there's no secrets because it's all yeah. public information. So yeah. I'm, I'm not like, call me if you want to know the answer. So <laughs> it, it, it I think that's the best way of building value though. Because yeah, I know for a fact, anything broke related, I'm going to go to you. I've even, I've always Because I've shown idea. I know the answer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 of yeah. course. But not just that as well. You had a personal touch to it as well. Cool. Like you told me a situation where you messed up because of someone else. It wasn't your fault. You've told me situations where you've sort of demonstrated your knowledge. You've worked on projects. You've been doing it for a while. So yeah man my go-to awesome. my, my go-to guy man but um yeah just for, just from a personal point of view man i just want to say like a, a massive thank you man Cheers, for man. obviously coming down taking a bit of time out educating me and uh, a lot of the the newbies man and i just want to say as well you play a big part in our property newbie community man awesome. in, in our group and everyone that's got a question you're always there helping out you're always showing love man so uh, that. <laughs> I just want to say, man, from my point of view, massive thank you, man. And yeah, we sure. can't wait this long to meet up again, man. Christmas, you said, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, man. So for anyone watching this, um, we're going to hopefully be doing a, a Christmas party at some point, man. And uh, maybe even get you to do a little talk. And uh, yeah, I'll man. do the DJ. I you could, could do I the DJ. Bro, with those headphones. Hidden talent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just need some decks, man. And we yeah. sorted, did it? Yeah. But yeah, guys, I just want to say thank you very much, Shaz, as nice always. Thank you very much. Bring it in, bro. Oh. Oh. Um, guys. <laughs> Peace out. Take care. Take it easy.